uh, Captain James Allen Len Lenningham, and I couldn't find anything on him because I did, this was back in uh, 2016 and they were just setting up the data banks now. So I went back again and there is a page on him and it tells where he served and that. But I read The Fighting Newfoundlander and it's about that thick. It's an excellent book. He tells about everybody and every battle in it. And this guy was at Beaumont Hamill and he was wounded three times, spent five hours in a shell hole and he crawled back with another soldier on his back. But he's only one of the stories, and that tells you how many stories are there, but they're not told. And I, I just couldn't leave them out. So. And for you internet guys, you've got to have a bit of, you know. Carrier pigeon was way off uh, communication. That's 100 years ago. Look where we're at today. And this is how they communicated on the lines. And there's, in the Fighting Newfoundlander, there's a really humorous story about the, fighter, about the pigeon carrier. But you guys got to read that. Now, this is um, one of those stories. Uh, they were, Newfoundlanders were down again to almost nobody. And they decided to put them in reserve and s s spare them the battle and send them into safety. And on their march to safety, the Germans hit them with a shell killed 10 and wounded 15 and this was one of the they killed actually one of the guys that was the, off the Monte 10 and this guy is uh, from John Chilliwack and he's age 26 and he served 832 days he's from Rigolet, Labrador and he had been considered one of the regiment's best snipers so he was the top sniper when he was killed and the sad story about this is that Two of his fellows that he had got to go over with them had been killed at Monte, and he was the only one left. And it is their tradition to always bring the bodies home. And not out of those three, not one of them got home. So that was really sad. And 1918 was usually trench warfare, and this is the piece that's in, in here. And this is uh, Rodney Ricketts. And he was age 17 when he uh, got the Victorian Order, Victorian Cross. And that would make him 15 when he joined. And he had already been wounded once. So this shows you how he is the youngest person to receive the order and the only Newfoundlander. And then the war ends, and it takes six months before the troops start to go home. And this is the piece that's out here. And this follows the regiment of 1918, because when I got it on the, on the uh, blanket, it, there wasn't enough room. It doesn't, it's really squished together. So I decided to make a piece for that. So there's 127 new recruits on it, 135 killed. 463 wounded in that year and 146 for a total of 1,116 forget-me-nots for that year. And I was telling you about Captain Wheeler beforehand and like when he asked me to do it in the battles and that I, you know, it took me like four years later, I'm still working on these things. And there was a couple of words that might have drifted in his direction, you know. <laughs> this, this was not the way it was planned to go. So this, this is the blanket here. And the blanket has uh, 6,820 forget-me-nots, and it should only be about 4,000. But if you got wounded, you got put in the next battle. So you would show up again and again and again. So by doing it by battle, doubled the amount uh, of work on the blanket. And each piece that I do always has a write-up, an exclamation, and all the battles and everything is explained. And the, uh, it is, the blankets are all Department of National Defense, which you can slightly see behind that there, where I put the Royal Newfoundland Regiment over it. And this was the colonel, and he came up and he sewed the last two forget-me-nots on the blanket. And you should have seen this guy make a French knot. I mean, if I had known he could make a French knot, I would have had him up there working. And then he looks at me and says, I'm a fly fisherman. Oh, I said, okay, so I need a fly fisherman. <laughs> and this is the Royal Navy, 
uh, uh, Royal Newfoundland Reserve, actually. And these were the first Newfoundlanders to go to World War I. And up here, uh, over here, there's three there. It's uh, Francis Shepherd, uh, Gordon Shepherd, and Henry. And they, uh, my great grandfather and my two great uncles. So three brothers went. And over here, this little one here, which I didn't even know about, is a cue boat. A cue boat is a boat that they, a fishing boat that they disguised, and it's got all the radio equipment, so it's all spies. So this explains the next piece, because this is the merchant marines, and you wouldn't want to be one of them because one out of three would die, because the Germans were sinking them because they thought they were cue boats. So that was one of the reasons he didn't want to be one. And this is the forestry. And the great thing about the forestry was that there's 526 on this, 11 died, but you had to have your own saw to join. You had to bring your own axe and saw because they, there was no money to supply. And this one here I did for the uh, Women's Aid Society. And there's 179 women from Newfoundland that went to war and one would die. She caught, I think, the Spanish flu. And this was the 1200 that, uh, this was how it was going to originally look. So I did get one in there. It looks like a field with forget-me-nots. Uh, they were shipped overseas, but they never served. The war ended. So they did not see battle. And this is the 3000 that I did for the ones that were in the other uh, forces, mostly Canadian. And this is why the, it was supposed to look like this. Now you'll see that if you read that up there, if you're trying to read that up there, they made it possible for, they made it possible, and those who now serve made it possible for Canadians to sleep safe under our blankets in the dark of night and wait to the light of a new day in the free and safe country. I'm totally dyslexic, so I always put the end of my sentences before the beginning, and sometimes my husband misses one when he's correcting them, or he's so used to the way that I speak that he doesn't notice it anymore, right? <laughs> so, and this one here, you, remember I showed you all the, when you cut the pieces out, uh, we don't throw anything out. So this is the odd pieces that were left over because, I mean, wool is really hard to get and really expensive. So this is just uh, called the wave, so it just shows the shore, and I just used all the end pieces. So I was just showing you um, a little something. Now, I'm going to come back here. This is, we're finished with the, um, Forget Me Not project, but I call the show Remembrance because my mom always taught me to be fair. So I did World War II. We were having a 50th anniversary for Westmount is where I grew up. And Westmount was a co-op where all the veterans lived. So there's 22 veterans that lived in these houses. So we went back and we got all the names of all the people. And then, silly little me, because I like doing stuff, uh, got the names of all the children. And all, like, there'd be four or five people over the 50 years that would have lived in those houses, so we put them all in. And this was the veterans and war brides, uh, is on the list over here. But on the bottom, it gives some credits, and one of them is Robert Grant. And he helped me put this together. Mr. Grant turned 100 last year. <laughs> well, two months ago, he turned 100. So, and his mind is fantastic. He was a great person to work with. Now, this was a project, the Afghanistan timeline, that was in with this one. This is just to show you, because it said in my bio that I sort of get carried away. And this was the hardest project that I have ever worked on. Gary would take me at night and reel the chair away from the computers and go to bed. Or I'd come up crying and say, this, he was only 19, and, and this one had a baby, and he never saw his baby, you know, and it was just a constant, constant turmoil because my three children were the same ages as all these men. So this timeline starts in 2002, and it shows all the people, 
um, this is a better one here. It shows a cross for each person, and then it shows a poppy for each one that was killed, and if you were wounded, I gave you one of these, and it gave you information, because I wanted you to see who we lost. And it was, it was heartbreaking working on this, but it had such a good review, the people really liked it. I had one person come up to me, and she said, my brother's there. You know, and it was so hard, but it was um, a really hard project, and there's 50, 58 posters on, on that one there. And the reason that came about was because when I launch, launched the Forget Me Not Blanket, I launched it at a dinner for the regiment, the Christmas dinner. And after the Christmas dinner, uh, one of the gentlemen came up and said, are you doing anything for Afghanistan? And I had been working on this off and on for maybe five or six years. He said, my son was killed there. He said, could you do something? And that's where this one came from. And if you look, the poster underneath is a poppy for every one that committed suicide since they came home. So, you, you know, you have to look at Afghanistan and it's really a hard, hard situation to work with, but I'm glad I did it. Uh, it's, I hope it, the father liked it. And this is the way it looked when it's all in a line. And then, of course, I did the Korean War, a poppy for everyone that was killed in the Korean War because it's called Canada's Forgotten War. And then I did one for a peacekeeper, every peacekeeper that was uh, killed. And this was at November the 11th, it was open. They opened the gallery, so people that went to the Remembrance Service came down and had a look at it at the Rotary Arts Center and it looked really good down there because I could get them all in one straight line. And this is my little mermaid. After four years of war, I created the Viking mermaid because my soul needed release and I wanted these men to know that I would live and enjoy this life I was given. And she's really bright because while I was working since 16 and 17, and 18, I had cataracts, so I couldn't see color. <laughs> and she, my, my daughter said, Mom, she's awful bright. And I said, no, she's not bright. And so <laughs> it wasn't until after I had the surgery that I realized that I couldn't see color. <laughs> because you lose your sight so, uh, so gradually, you don't realize it. So everything looked like it was, you know, it was a different shade, but, but you know, it worked. I got it done. Um, and in just to show, because it says that I am a bit crazy, uh, these are books that I published in 2016. I had an 89 page of uh, coloring book, and I had created 200 pages. <laughs> and the thing magic artwork was uh, done with a mouse and a Commodore 64 in 1999. And I started for my first granddaughter, Brooklyn, and finished in 2017 for my second granddaughter. <laughs> so, uh, and the ABC book that's had many edits over the years, so that finally got published in 2018. So I, I wasn't always working on one project. And this is my Newfoundland buffet table, and this is my art show that I had in, at the Arts and Culture. Uh, so yes, I do painting, I do print work, I do woodwork, I do rug hooking. Uh, I come from a small place and I'm an artist, so you gotta make a living. So, you know, you adjust. And um, uh, this one here is the middle of the buffet table. It's a piece of stained glass. This is eight feet long, this table. And um, it's hauling the laundry through because the tables represent the women and the crafts that they used. So uh, laundry, I can remember hanging clothes on the line. I hated it. This is the, uh, it's lit from the bottom. And uh, my husband did the lighting for it because he does all that kind of stuff. So it looked really nice. Um, uh, now, I'm going to tell you this story. The light man at the Arts and Culture Centers uh, said when he was doing his close down, closing down for the night, he took the corner and the table was lit. And the place was quite dark and the table looked wonderful. 
he, he just stood there for a moment and took it in. And, and he, had, he, he contacted me and told me this. He said, Jackie, I had to tell you. He said, I, it just looks so wonderful. And I was so, oh, it's not very often you get someone to come back and tell you something about a piece. So, um, oh, okay. This shows you how crazy I really am. Uh, let's see. 60 seconds. And it excused music because I had to go for uncopyrighted stuff, right? So, and I did get a grant for this. I got a $1,000 grant and I spent $998 on supplies. So I got a nickel an hour. <laughs> and it's just that when I see something in my head, it, it, it comes together. Oh, the, uh, that's the, I don't know if you have them here, root cellars. This was my very first rug. And this is dough boys, peas pudding, and dessert. <laughs> so, and now with this one here, uh, this is what the table would look like set up. And the vegetables were embroidered by the ladies from Conch who did the Conch tapestry. And if you ever get to Newfoundland, go to Conch and see this piece of work. It's absolutely fabulous. And I was watching the CBC and they did a story on root cellars, hence the root cellar on the bottom. And just in case, I had the wooden bowl and I had this tapestry, it was a certain size. I spent a week looking for something that I could put the tapestry on. The kids are still looking for their Fisbee. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is safe in our house. <laughs> and the, the, salt fee, the salt fish is, the, you know, it's our modern history. It's what Newfoundland is based on. And this started my hooking obsession because I wanted a salt fish and I called the local group of rug hookers and I said, can I pay someone to hook a rug for me? And they said, no, we will teach you. So that was 11 and a half years ago and I've hooked 140 rugs since then. So and this is the peas pudding because the women are the cement that keeps the family together because most men were gone for months and years. There's a story of one man gone for 12 years and it shows up, you know, oh, well, I'm home. <laughs> and the Doughboys boy, the are a really interesting story because I think it's between the friends, uh, Sandra Bell Lundy, her mother, her grandmother was from uh, Newfoundland and at age, um, I'm not sure if it's eight or seven now, I think it was eight, was put in the service in Newfoundland Newfoundland was extremely poor, and we had big families. So as you got old enough, the parents would put them out so they could get fed. They would go, and so this little girl would stand on a chair and bake bread, do dishes and whatever. And her mom gave her a dish. And uh, Sandra said, this is the most valuable possession she has, because her mother's passed it down. Her mother, at age eight, kept that dish with her her whole life. And this is the cartoon story that she's telling about this dish in her china cabinet. And it's absolutely wonderful because at age 18, her grandma wanted to get married because she had met someone and the lady of the house said, if you do not get married, I will buy you a dress. She got married. <laughs> so there's, uh, and this one here, um, the Newfoundlanders, sorry, uh, during World War I, Let's see, 62,685 pairs of socks the women knit, 8,984 pairs of trigger bits, that's the ones that you can actually get your fingers out so you can pull up the trigger, and 22,422 mufflers. Uh, were, and this one here was done by uh, Mrs. Druggett, Nina Druggett of Lark Harbor, because I can't knit. And uh, mom had nine girls, could knit, sew, crochet, do it all, but she never had time to teach us because she was always busy with us. So anyway, uh, Nina knit these for me and I just put them into the dessert. And I think they said it was the value of about $5 million that they had sent overseas. And you, you know how poor Newfoundland was at this time? And of course, the, the Newfoundlanders, you want it to be a Newfoundlander's friend because they would trade these. And this was, uh, I'm fascinated by the Zodiac. So this was my piece that I did on the Zodiac which uh, was all wooden pieces. 
and I had these all cut out and my mom took sick and so that was 2011 and she died and I dumped them all into a box and I went back about nine months later and it took me about another two months to figure out where the pieces went. So <laughs> that I, every time I look at those I remember mom. So that's mom's piece. Now I, don't, I, I do a lot of reading. Um, I haven't read much in the last five years because of my eyes but I'm hoping to get back into it. Um, but I read Tuesdays with Murray. Murray. And there was a wonderful quote in it, and he says in it, parents can't help but affect their uh, children. Some s smudge them, some crack them, and some shatter them. And this is what came to me mind when I read that piece. And I just, this was my piece, and it was reflective, so when you look into it, you can see yourself, but you don't see yourself clearly. So somewhere along the line, everybody fits into that category. And um, I love the jigsaw. And this piece here was made out of three pieces of six by one by six pine, inch pine. And because I live in a small community and I am creating all the time, I recycle things. Most of my work is destroyed and recycled. So this one here, um, under the sea in an octopus's garden, his name was George. And uh, we took George and we went back and we did this to George. This, uh, I had the uh, public piano for the Deer Lake Airport and I cannot, uh, I, I can't sing. I mean, you're looking at the person that was asked to leave the church choir. So, you know, I really appreciate anyone that can play, but I figured the piano should be for people to look at that can't play as well as for people that can play and Gary always makes me the top because the top is always liftable off so that the tuner can get at the piano. So this is what happened to George. And uh, when I was in, uh, I went back to school uh, when I was 50 and got my arts degree and the kids used to call me the uh, queen of the jigsaw. Oh, and I collect science fiction figures. <laughs> and you've you seen that little, uh, the, um, what are those little yellow things called? Did the kids like them? Minions, right. I didn't know what they were either, but everyone was buying them, so I said, well, the piano's got to have some minions, right? And I didn't know these little critters make noise. So I had him go into a cave, but he was too tall. So I said, okay, we got to do something about this. So I took the minion and I took him downstairs with my saw. I said, I'm sorry, buddy, you're going to lose your eggs. So I, I turned him over like this and I put him down and I goes down and he goes, no. <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm sorry, it's art. <laughs> so you get all these little funny little stories when you're doing these things. So this is what the piano looks like when it's finished. So it's, it's uh, and I just finished the uh, piano, they, they replaced that piano and that was actually, uh, the college took it as a piece of art. So this one here now is uh, up there and it was all animals. So on this side over here is a road map and on this side over here explains all the animals. And um, up in the corner you see the polar bear. The polar bear is wearing little tiny um, snowshoes. And these are made by a man who's 100 years old. We seem to live long in Newfoundland. He's 100, and his, uh, he made over 10,000 pairs of these and donated all the proceeds to the hospital. So his, his, there's a little thing on the side of the piano that says that. Um, anytime I use anybody else's piece of art, I will always give them credit on my work. And this is, uh, these little guys up here, they're uh, pine, pine martens. And then you've got your otters, and then you've got your hares. And this is my husband over here, Gary's Home Renos, because my daughter married a guy with three houses, and my husband has been doing Renos for five years. So that's just a little inside joke. And up here in the corner is one of the five wild balonies that's hidden in there. And uh, everybody knows that there's wild balonies, you know. Bologna is the number one meat in Newfoundland, you know, so you've got to have wild balonies. So you gotta look for those. 
And of course, the, the moose is felted, and I had never felted anything before, so I decided to felt the moose. And about after two weeks in, I put on these antlers. The antlers fell off because they were heavier than the moose. So I said, all right, now you're a cow. And um, <laughs> that would work. So then I stood around. And I had gone on YouTube, right? This, that's what you do. You go on YouTube to figure out how to do things. And armature, no, you don't need I said, you don't need an armature. I said, OK. So gets them out done and gets down to the legs and puts her in the thing. And a week later comes, she's tumbled over. I said. Then I go back to the video. And of course, you never go from the beginning to the end of the video, right? Yeah. And she said, I've been doing this for 30 years, so new people will likely want to use amateurs. <laughs> so then I'm looking at it, and I call my son, who lives in Langford, and we're discussing the piano. And I said, well, Mom, he said, you know, why don't you just put him in a lake? You know, cut off the legs and put him in a lake. So that's what I did. I mean, it was two weeks' work. I wasn't going to approve it. So, so if, when you see, if you ever get to Deer Lake, you'll know the story behind the moose. And I love old furniture. So this is inner and outer space. And it's really like when you look in, there's got all these little holes in it. So you see a different scene every place that you look in. And you see eyes. I'm always fascinated with eyes. Uh, and uh, this is a dresser that I did. And this one is, I was thinking about all the things that we find in the drawers. I mean, my house, there's not one drawer that you can actually fit another thing in. and. Um, so this was an old dresser, and I had really a lot of fun doing this. And uh, the back and the top, you can see it's down here is my ode to Buffy, the vampire. You know, my, my, my kids said, you know, Mom, we're, we grew up on Buffy the vampire, angel, out lost in space, Star Trek. She said, yeah, we turned out OK. So, and this is the side, and it's got buttons in it. It's got all sorts of, this is all the stuff that actually came from drawers in my house. And um, th there's my Buffy. And I had a vampire, that little uh, coffin uh, stood on, it was on my, you know, you come for a coffee at my place, and on the uh, end table would be this coffin with this Barbie vampire in it. So. And I collect figurines, female figurines. So these are all females. And the Dark Crystal was an absolutely fabulous cartoon out, and it had a beautiful woman who was the main character. And when all the th characters came out, she wasn't made. I wrote Mattel. Mattel writes back and said, we only make them for the boys. Girls don't buy, buy toys. <laughs> well, they got back another letter, which I didn't get an answer to. So. Uh, and this is, this is what happens when you go to Stonehenge, right? The Library of Space and Time. And uh, I just happened to get a, a pair of shoes that came, while well, my son takes size 14. So he got a pair of shoes that fit in this steel box, right? So this whole thing, except for the table, fits back into that box. And it's all made with CDs and stuff like that. And um, it was really a lot of fun doing it because uh, that's my cat who's not very happy right now because we're away. And um, this, it's also got mirrors on the bottom so that you can, it reflects, so it looks like you're falling into space. Yeah, I get carried away. <laughs> so, and I, I do things in threes. So this is my war bride, because my mom is a war bride. So this is, uh, when, when we were in England, you go on a lot of tours and it's stained glass. So this is the way the stained glass looked on the floor is the first one. So she's a bit, uh, you know, out of shape. The next one is a painted glass. And the last one is the hooked rug, which the, the rooms bought. That's our national, our provincial gallery. And the teddy bear, uh, the piece itself states that, like, she's standing on a wharf. She's just arrived in Newfoundland. And I ran the Newfoundland War Bride site for 12 years. When they came over here, a lot of the women didn't recognize their husbands because you were a debonair. You were in your outfits, you know, your uniforms. You were handsome. You know, you were a handsome critter. And then when they come back here, they're in their fisherman gear. They got beards. They're, you know, they did not recognize. A lot of the women didn't even get off the boats. A lot of them just went back home. Um, but this one here. She's arriving with her children. The bear is missing a leg, just to represent that they're coming from a war-torn country. Everything she owns is in that suitcase. The boat is what's brought them here, and it's anchored, so this is her new life. 
the iceberg is maybe it's a wee bit cold here, but it separates the towns and the cities that she came. Because when my mom came, she didn't have any winter clothes or anything because they didn't have snow. And then she says, you know, where's the toilet? It's outside. What do you mean? You know, where's the uh, the butcher? Where's the, the you know? They had their milk delivered. They had their food, their bread delivered every day. None of that. You had to make it if you wanted it. So it was a stark uh, reality for them. Uh, plus, the, the sun is it's going to hope. <laughs> it's going to get better. So, you know, when I, when I do my work, I do think about the things that I put into it. Uh, I just can't explain it very well on paper. I think that's why I always get turned down for my grants. The, um, <laughs> and this was my thing of words because, you know, like, uh, I do most of my stuff by memory because the um, you know, words are a bit weird. And, and this was a piece, uh, this actually hangs up in my bedroom. Uh, it's about seven feet by five feet. And she's looking up, and it's more or less, who's looking back at us when we're looking up at the sky? And um, I, had I was going to donate it to the college, uh, and I was talking to the professor there. Oh, she said, there's no life out there. I said, excuse me? She said, there's no life other than what's on Earth. I said, OK. <laughs> so it, the college never got it. <laughs> and this is what happens when you go to Henry Moore's. Now, these are the kids' building blocks, right? So the kids didn't use them anymore. They were a bit older now. So uh, and I do a lot of woodworking. So these are pieces that I have more fun with the pieces that are left out of the projects than the actual projects. And, and these are actually all the pieces that were left out of cut out pieces. And when I put them together, they just look like conversations. Like, like the first one to say, ah, oh, what's going on? And the next one is they're talking about her and she's saying, oh, you know, like this. And the other one is there is the three of them are in a little circle. And the other one, everybody wants to get into the conversation. They're in number four. And in this one here, he's kissing her feet, you know, yeah. And then, you know, so it's all different pieces like how, you know, face to face. And that. so it just, it was just in fun. They were really fun to do, actually, when you look at them. Okay, guys, you're going to like this one. The change. This is my take on menopause. <laughs> so uh, this was, uh, I was named one of the rug, rug cookers of the year for the uh, Rug Cooking Museum of North America in, in um, Nova Scotia, Heart Nova Scotia. So this is one of the pieces that they have on show. And um, this took about 10 years. All my pieces are like 10 years in the making running through. This is you know, a cardboard piece first, and, but I went to rug camp and I noticed that all the women were getting up and leaving and it was so hot and they were having hot flashes and I said, oh, time to revive this, have another look at it. So what it is, she's standing on a, uh, a woman of a certain vintage, is standing on a wharf and she's looking at that iceberg and that iceberg looks really good. It looks better than any young buck of her youth, right? So she jumps in a punt and that's a small boat in Newfoundland and she's going to get a piece of that iceberg. So she gets out to the iceberg, off comes the clothes. So she lies down and she melts through and she comes through a nice, you know, blue, nice cool blue. And then she just sort of swims away. So you just see the flick of the tail. So she has now changed into a mermaid. And the last one was not originally part of the series, but we were on a trip and this was hooked in a car driving around Nova Scotia. And uh, it's the mermaid taking a look back through the portholes. And uh, she's got a GPS built in because a woman always knows where she's going. And of course, she's got the Viking, or the Viking, I'm sorry, the, um, I'm looking for it now, Vulcan, thank you. Vulcan hand, handshake. Because I love Star Trek. And no, I have never seen Star Wars. Uh, so, um, you're either one or the other, right? Uh, so this was, th this is, takes about 22 feet to show. They're, they're quite large, the pieces. And it was really fun. And I, I've had it in art in the church. Uh, I ran art in the church at the United Church for 12 years where it was a really great program where artists, it didn't matter if you were professional or non-professional, bring your art in, we display it. And people got to see it. And it was great fun. It ran for about three days every year. And uh, 
so I had this on there and one of the ladies came in and she was on a bus tour and she said, why don't you send it into the uh, rug hooking magazine in the States? So I did and they published it as the Canadian content. So that's being published this piece here. And it was really a lot of fun. Except was going to be because when we were in Europe, all the washrooms got different latches and different things and some of them were really skinny and some of them were expensive. So I was going to do this little movie um, bathroom <laughs> and it never got to it, but this is what I did salvage from it because I was putting the set all together. So this I had the set all built. So I was trying out the dolls in it to see before I made the characters. <laughs> so
I always get carried away, so that is my future plant, which is our plant for Newfoundland. So I just doodled it and had fun with it. And I sell these at the uh, market because I like going to the market because um, I get to meet people. Most artists, we live in our own little place, right? And don't get out very often, as you can see. <laughs> so, and I want to say one thing while I'm here. Everything you've seen here, most of it is in my house. And my husband is sitting in the back. And I told him if anything happens to me, he stays far away from an artist as possible. He said, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> he is extremely, uh, he's been my um, technician, my go to, my carrier, my tech guy. Because without him, believe me, he wouldn't see any of this. But uh, so I think that's it. If you guys got any questions? Are your uh, war rugs, are they in, on a permanent display anywhere? Uh, I had 23 rugs on display at the Rug Museum, but they are coming down. They were up all oh, summer. But not in any war museum or no. anything? They should be. Yeah. You have to be able to write up things. Like I've written up yeah. things and I've sent out, yeah. and, but I don't get any replies. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you can only do what you can do yeah, and yeah. Yeah. send it out. And, because we have a World War One museum in yes. in uh, Newfoundland, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll write it up again and see. Because yeah. everybody that mm -hmm. sees it says it should be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. But, uh, or in the national. It's, it's yeah. making that connection. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's, well, excellent. So everything that you've seen here is in my house under my bed. Very high bed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how lovely. Well, it's coming out now that I'm not allowed to make anything that won't fit on the bed. <laughs> that's, that's coming to us because yeah. we have a three-story bed, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're working on the bottom, uh, rug hooking in the middle, and sewing, and different things on top. And the computer room is mine. We just put in the floor and uh, we took out 16 boxes of mm. books and mm -hmm. stuff and that's not something that was already out. <laughs> so I'm still looking for stuff because then I'll go back where I had a book. So. <laughs> and I got a shed out back. <laughs> <laughs> that she uses her shed. I love your work. Yeah. How prolific you are. And why?